I begin with a, a moment of confession. Uh, if you found yourself thinking last week's sermon was not up to snuff, you were right. I got back home and after lunch I sat down and thought, eh. So, I appreciate your graciousness in returning even when I'm not always uh, the best I could be. When I was 17, I ran what was to be the first of many big projects I've been involved with. I ran my Eagle Scout project. And it was 40 or so youth, probably 15 adults, and two weekends of lots of sweat. And it was to be the first uh, of many. I went off to college and I got involved in a music group, uh, Find Me Alpha, and uh, they had a jazz fest. I got involved in running this, this jazz festival. 42 bands, four sites, 12 judges, one major recording artist, two concerts, and uh, shirts advertising the whole nine yards, grants, nine to five, fifteen thousand dollar budget. And uh, I ran a good festival, but I was one of the worst types of leaders you could find because I did everything. Absolutely everything. If you ask, can I help you, I would tell you exactly what to do. I was a micromanager. What I'm trying to say is I was a micromanager, that horrible tyrant of a leader. And uh, I went off to seminary. And I got involved in other big projects. I, I organized a two-year lecture series on homosexuality in the church. I uh, put together a mission trip for my youth group. I designed a conference on how theology and care for creation changes how we build our churches. I, I helped put together a, uh, a, a, a ministry to people on the street, and that's, which is still running, actually. It's Open Table Ministries. You can find it online. They have a, a tagline now, helping broken people break bread together. I wish I was wise enough to have come up with that myself, because that's, that's pretty good. But uh, some... How, in the midst of going from micromanager Andy in Missouri, at some point as I was driving across the plains on my way east, I realized I got to change how I'm doing this. Because if I keep on trying to do everything, I'm not, I wasn't only burning the candle at both ends, I think I was burning it in the middle too. And uh, that gets awkward. And not only was I doing that, when you micromanage people, what you're telling them is, I don't trust you. And so it, I was doing things in a pretty destructive fashion. And so I had to reassess how I, I, how I led. How do I, when I'm given authority, how do I handle that? And I think I have changed that significantly a decade on. Uh, I've gotten a lot better. If you say you're going to do something, I say, thank you. And I let you go and do it. And, and that, that's your gig. And, and I hope you do it. But uh, I'm still working on delegating more. But uh, I've gotten better. But we have these moments in our lives where we have to reassess, look at ourselves and say, is what I'm doing working? Is it getting me where I need to go? It could be reassessing how you lead. It could be reassessing how you're raising kids, how you relate to your spouse, how you relate to your, your parents. It could be your career. It could be reassessing what you believe about God. I mean, these are, there are moments where we need to reassess, where am I going? And how am I going to get there? And, and, how's that, what I, and what I, is what I'm doing making sense? Now, admittedly, this is not the type of question we ask every day. It, it really can't be. Some days we can't take the time to ponder big questions because we got to get the work done. And, and that's, but that's the culture we come from, right? We, we come from a culture where if, if there's a problem, what do we do? Work, 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 work. We, I mean, what, what do we have? We have the Protestant work ethic. If there's a problem, you just push, 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 push. But if we don't take time to look up on occasion, what we run the risk of is, um, well, you ever see that far side, com uh, far side comic? You ever see this before? Yeah. Midvale School for the Gifted. That kid is gifted. He's going up. He is just pushing on that door. He's going to get in. And the door says... Pull. And uh, there can be times in which we get so busy push, 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 pushing that we don't realize the problems we, we might be causing ourselves, that we're not actually getting where we need to go. I think one of the most common signs of this, one of the most common signs that we need to reassess how we're handling our lives, and something we do often or are tempted to do, is when we feel like we have to work through the Sabbath. 
let's be honest about what we're saying when we work through the Sabbath. When we say we're, we need to work through the Sabbath, what we're saying is we're more important than God. Because God took six days to work, and then he, God took a day off, right? And, and if we say that we've got to work seven days, we're saying our work is more important than God's work. God has time to take down time and enjoy creation. And, and, and if we don't, we might, be work, we, might, we, might be, we might need to reassess how we're doing things. And so we do need to ask these questions on, on occasion. And they happen naturally, uh, depending on big events in life. You have a child, you, re you reassess your life. You, you change careers, you reassess your life. You have major events, major uh, happenings, for a, a forgiveness, a, a, a moment of grace, a mountaintop of experience. That can change your life and cause you to, to reassess. Uh, some of you have gone down to see Les Miserables. And, and uh, for those of you who have, that moment when the bishop... Uh, forgives Jean Valjean. That is a moment where his entire life changes. He reassesses everything. And for those of you who haven't seen it, sorry, uh, go watch, the, go listen to the music sometime. It's great. But these type of events do not happen often. And for most, for most of the time when it comes to reassessing our lives, what we need is the church year, which brings us to this wonderful season we find ourselves in today. We are in the season of Lent. We are in this, this season of Lent. And in the season of Lent, it's the time when we listen to people like John the Baptist who hollers out from the wilderness, get your life together. Make straight the ways of your life. Make straight the ways of the Lord. And God's showing up. You get, get your act together. Fill in the valleys. Knock down the mountains. God's on his way. Make sure the path is clear for him, him to land. And so that's what John the Baptist comes to ask. Are we preparing to welcome God into our lives daily and consistently? If we keep on doing what we're doing, are we going to be holier in five years? Will we, will we be closer to God? Will we continue or start to be co-workers with God to build God's kingdom? Now, as you might guess, John the Baptist would be an utter buzzkill at a party. You would not have him over for a dinner gathering because he is just so serious. Relax, John, just relax. But, uh... But on occasion, you need to listen to folks like that who ask these hard questions and, and at a time like this during Lent. Now, the interesting thing about going to John the Baptist to, to answer his questions, to, to seek his guidance in reassessing your life, the interesting thing about going to John is that he's not convenient, is he? He's not convenient at all. He is not here and local. He is out there. He is out in the wilderness, right? He is out in the place where if you want something to eat, you chew on a locust. That, that's not here in town, is it? If you think about like that first century couple thinking about their day and the husband's going off to work and asking the wife what you're up to and the wife says, you know, I'm, I'm going to do some laundry and I'm going to weave, go to the market, get something for dinner. And then I thought, it, thought I'd go see John the Baptist to reassess my entire life and how I'm seeking God and then I'd come home and make dinner. I mean, you, that's not how it happened, right? You don't just squeeze John the Baptist in between your appointments and kind of squeeze him in before dinner. If you're going to go see John the Baptist, you're taking a hike. You're going to go to John the Baptist. You're going to commit, and it's going to take you a while to get there. And, and I don't think taking a while to get there, I don't think it's hard for the sake of being hard. I mean, taking a hike, going out to see John the Baptist, it's not easy, but there is something important about the journey to go see him. Something about the journey in the wilderness to get to John the Baptist prepares you to answer the questions he asks. We, we talked about wilderness a bit last week. We talked about how wilderness... It is different than our usual life, and it is what God uses multiple times throughout Scripture to train people, to teach people, to form people, so people can find him, find God, and get their head on straight. It, it, Moses leads the people, and they spend 40 years in the wilderness. Elijah has his midlife crisis. He goes out into the wilderness. Jesus is preparing for his ministry. He goes out into the, the wilderness, right? You go to the wilderness, and there's something about it that helps you find God. Now, there are a lot of things that are different than in the wilderness than what we're used to today. I mean, it's, you go out in the wilderness and it's harder to cook. Finding a place to sleep is a challenge. The weather becomes very important. The snow, I mean, it's annoying out there. But if you were living outside in the wilderness, this would not just be annoying. This would be 
a problem, wouldn't it? And so I don't think those are necessarily, though, the things that prepare us to hear John the Baptist's questions. I don't think every aspect of the wilderness is something that we need to, to replicate in our lives. I do think there are some aspects of the wilderness that are important, though. And I'm not going to say that, I'm going to give you three. I'm not going to say these are exhaustive, but here are the three that I, I believe according to my reading of scripture. Here are the three things about the wilderness that are important and that these are the parts that help us seek God. The first thing about the wilderness we talked about last week, there's no noise. Right? No noise, no cell phones, no TV, no, no internet, no not just silence or intentional communication, music, stuff like that. There is no noise. And so it's a lot easier to hear yourself and to hear God in the wilderness. The second thing about uh, the wilderness that helps us prepare to hear John the Baptist is uh, we're not in control. And when you're not in control, I mean, think about how, how much control we're in right now. We're in absolute control of, I can, I can hit a dial right here, and we, we can change the temperature around us. We can go downstairs. We can pick and control what we eat. We control where we go. We jump in our... We are used to being in absolute control. And when you're in the wilderness, you're not. We'll talk more about that next week. But it's this third aspect of being in the wilderness that we're going to look at today. When you go out in the wilderness, how far can you see? Think about that. How far can you see when you're out in the wilderness? Think about how far you can see in the wilderness compared to how close your life is day by day. When you st get up tomorrow morning and you get started in your, your Monday morning work, what do you, how, how close is it? I mean, you work on your computer screen, it's right there. You read the newspaper, it's right there. You work, you make breakfast, it's right there. I mean, all the things we do day to day, they're all right here. They're all very close. This is one of the biggest rooms in our community. And you know how big this room is? Small. We, we live in a very small, I mean, and that's okay. Most of our life is small things, small tasks. I mean, day by day, we have to put our head down and do small things. That's how we live. But on occasion, got to get out in the wilderness and get our heads up and look. And you can see. When you can just see across the field, how far can you see? When you look across the field and it is flat as flat can be in a Midwestern field, how far can you see? The sun beats down on you and you just see the wind moving across the grasses. That, you can see a distance, can't you? It's a bigger scope. It's, it's a lot easier. You want to think about where you're going in your life. Is it, if you're trying to think about where you're going in life and everything's this close, how far out can you think? Tomorrow? Maybe the next week? How far out can you think when you're looking across a distance that's uncountable miles? Or if you go up a mountain or a hill, you go up to the top of this high place and you're standing there between the, the skies above you and the, the land below and you can just see and everything looks tiny and, va and you just vast spanses across in front of you. A lot easier to imagine the rest of your life when you're looking that far out, isn't it? A lot, a lot easier to ask the, these big questions. Is the rest of my life lined up? so that I am making straight the paths of the Lord. Am I going where I need to be going? You get close up, you think about next week. You look across the plains, five years, ten years out, seems a little bit more reasonable to think about, doesn't it? That's why I think when you're going to go out and see John the Baptist, you've got to hike through the wilderness. Because you've got to look down the road, way down the road. I wish that I could tell you all to go take a hike right now in love. I mean, I would want you to come back, of course. I, I wish I could tell you all to go take a hike, go spend a couple hours in the wilderness and find the place you can see, the farthest that you can see, and, and start thinking about where you're headed. I was even going to think about suggesting like getting outside this afternoon, but, and that made sense when I wrote this sermon yesterday. That's not going to happen today, is it? <laughs> We're not going to be able to take a hike, most of us. Even if those of us who are able-bodied probably don't want to take a hike today. But that does not mean that we cannot attend to these elements of the wilderness that help us turn towards God. I mean, last week I, I, I suggested that you might want to limit the noise in your life so that we might have more music and more silence. This week, The next week we'll talk about control and, and letting not always being in control, but this week I want to ask you, and I want you to think about long distances. 
great scopes, vast plains. I'd like to, you to get that sense in your mind and look way down the road and ask yourself a few questions. Ponder to yourself, if, if, what's the path of my life and where is it headed? Where am I going, not just next week, not just the week after, but where am I going five years from now? Where am I going to be 20 years from now? And what's, what am, how am I going to get there? Is my life going to be holier next year so that I'm taking that next step in where I believe God calls me to be? Not just a little bit down the road, but way down the road. I wrote these questions down on a sheet of paper. You should have those in your bulletin. And, and as I said, don't go home and think about these on the porch, but go home this afternoon. And before you begin the daily grind of Monday, take those questions and at least look out a window at a tree or something like that and think about where you're going down the road. Is your path straight for the Lord this day and many years from now? Amen.